thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today. Well, we've got one of our favorite guests back with us today, Diane Lang. And if she's new to some of you, well, you're, you're really going to like this woman. She really knows what she's talking about, has excellent tips, and we're going to get a lot of great tips today as she discusses the effects of loneliness and steps we can take to bounce back. She's got some strategies that can help everyone, no matter the age, and she will be available to take your questions at the end of her presentation. Now, this webinar will last about an hour. All video and audio lines will be muted. And if you have a question for Diane, and we certainly encourage conversation, you can just scroll down to the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A, and you can type your questions out there. I am happy to read them to Diane at the end of her presentation. Diane, it is always a good day when you're on board. I am looking forward to another informative webinar from you. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you everybody for being here. So welcome to Bouncing Back from Loneliness. So a little bit about me if you've never seen me before. I'm Diane Lang and I am a therapist, have been a therapist for over 20 years. I am also in the education side. I have been an adjunct professor at Montclair State uh, University as well as Rutgers University for about 15 years. So I've been on both sides of the field teaching and as a therapist. So today as I talk about loneliness and isolation, please feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat board. I'll speak for a while and then I'm gonna leave plenty of time for Q and A. So if you have any questions, just put it up there and we will get to them. So thank you for being here. So I just wanted to start out a little bit with kind of a little information about loneliness and isolation. So during the last year, and actually it's longer than a year, it's about a year and three months that we have been in the COVID lockdowns where you know we have had to deal with things that we've never dealt with before. We had to deal with things that we couldn't prepare or plan for and it lasted a lot longer than it was supposed to. Because if you remember going back to March, 2020, it was supposed to be two weeks to a month, right? We were gonna just lock down, make sure the hospitals had enough room for everybody and then open back up. And here we are a year and three months later. And I know for me, cause I am in the New York City tri-state area, we were really hit really hard and we were locked down for way longer. We actually just opened up fully a few weeks ago where now everything is finally open. But during this whole year and a half almost of dealing with COVID, one of the things that we have seen is that we've seen a mental health crisis. And the reason behind the crisis is not just because we went through COVID and people getting sick, which of course could be an absolute part of it. And I hope here nobody knows anybody who got really sick or who passed on. And if you do, I'm so sorry for anybody's loss. But there's so many other reasons that we were feeling this mental health crisis. And one of the top factors is depression. And what happens is one of the top factors of depression outside of mental illness or genetic mental illness is loneliness and isolation. When we feel lonely, when we feel isolated, that leads to depression. And in a year like this, it was challenging to so many people of all different ages. So loneliness and isolation, which can play a factor in anybody's life outside of a pandemic, really got challenged this year with the pandemic. But in general, just to give a little bit of knowledge outside of a pandemic, 46 million Americans say that they either have just one person or nobody that they can trust. That's a huge number. Think about that, 46 million Americans. So that means there are so many people in our country alone who are really feeling the effects of loneliness and isolation. And again, that has nothing to do with the pandemic. People feel this in general. So a little bit about this, being that loneliness and isolation are top factors of depression, let's dive in a little bit. So what is loneliness? So loneliness is when you feel alone, you feel that you have no one to talk to. You have feelings of sadness, anxiety. You find it very difficult to make friends, to socialize and to have a support system. Now, now that we just said that 
factors of depression or loneliness and isolation. Just so you know, on the other side, the top factors of happiness are socialization. And socialization includes fun, it includes community, and it includes a support system. So as you can see right here, our top factors to being happy and optimistic is having that socialization, having that support system, having that community. Those are really important things for our overall health and happiness. So when we're feeling the opposite, we're feeling that sadness, we're feeling it you know, being that we're just alone, we have no one to talk to, we're feeling anxious, that absolutely could lead to depression. Now on the other side of the loneliness, we also have isolation, which means that we're just not having enough contact with people. And I just wanna put out there, we're social creatures. All human beings are social creatures. And even if you consider yourself an introvert, because there's you know, different personality types, right? Some are extroverted, some are introverted. Now I'm an extrovert. I love people, I get energy, I get refreshed when I'm around other people. I have a client who's a real extrovert, even more than me, and he said, you know, I don't drink coffee in the morning, but I don't feel energized until I talk to somebody in the morning, which he said is really tough when he has people who he lives with who are not very extroverted or morning people. But a lot of people who are extroverted, they get their energy, they get their feeling good, their happiness from others. On the other side, there's introverts. And again, there's no right or wrong. There's no judgment. They're just different personality types. But an introvert is somebody who's a little bit quieter, likes to spend more time alone. And I've always gotten asked this, and my clients have actually at, you know, answered this without me even asking, but people always say, you know, is this an, introvert, an introvert's dream? They got to stay in. You know, they didn't have to worry about going out, being around people. And in the beginning, I have a few clients who are complete introverts who said, wow, I'm really loving this lockdown. I don't have to worry about going out. I don't have to worry about being on, putting my makeup. I could just be home. This is a dream. And I think it felt like that for the first few months. But once COVID really got into the middle of it and we were feeling like Groundhog Day where everything just blended and felt the same, even my introverted clients and friends we're feeling the effects of the isolation and loneliness because we are all human beings and we all need socialization. And even though for an extrovert that might be, you know, might look different, they might like going to parties, to concerts, being around large groups, and an introvert might be the opposite. They might like a lot of one on one, they might like just going out for dinner, being around one other person at a time. We still all need that socialization and we all need support. So just to put that out there, for us to heal, for us to grieve, forgive, to work through anything, we need a support system. So whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, we still need other people. We still need connection. And even though during COVID and lockdowns, we were connecting virtually, but remember that took a while too, because in the beginning we thought we were gonna go back to normal. So no one really did anything. And I remember, cause I was teaching college and I think it was the March 13th or 14th, somewhere around there in my area, in the New York, New Jersey area. We were at college teaching and they said, this will be the last day. Our spring break will be extended for a few weeks and then we'll come back. So no one even thought about going virtual because we just kept assuming we were gonna go back. By the time we all realized this was gonna be much longer than we thought, then we started doing a little bit of virtual, but it took a while before everybody switched. And at that point, people were already starting to feel the loneliness, the isolation, the sadness, and the fear. So even though we started doing virtual, it took a while. That was one piece. The other piece is Virtual is great, and I am grateful and thankful that we have virtual. I don't know what we would have done without it, right? We kept our schools going, the colleges, we got our socialization, our classes in. But the best form of connection and socialization is still being in person. And that's something that we still always need. Again, virtual, phone, they're all great, but they're not the same as being in person. So we really do need that socialization. 
And I do have to say, even though everything is pretty much open, even here in my area, and everything's starting to get back to a little sense of normalcy, I have a lot of clients who've been really affected by all this loneliness and isolation and grief and fear that they're now having social anxiety, trying to get back out into the world. And they're not necessarily afraid of COVID. They have their vaccines. They've done everything correctly. They're more afraid of socialization. They're getting social anxiety, something they never had before. And that is something that we've seen because we've gotten so comfortable being locked down and we got comfortable in our own homes. Now going out and opening up has become tough and anxious and fearful for a lot of people as well. So that can add on to the loneliness or isolation because we want to go out, we want to connect, but yet now we're having all of this fear of, can I do this? How do I do this? I had a client say to me a few weeks ago, but in this month, she said, you know, I'm so glad everything opened. I'm really excited, but I haven't been on a date now in over a year and four months. I don't even know how to date. And she's divorced. She's in her fifties. And she's like, I want to get back out there, but I'm so scared. I I haven't even dated. I don't even know what it's like to go on a date. What do I wear? What do I do? I feel so awkward and uncomfortable. And those are the things we're seeing. We're seeing people feel awkward, uncomfortable to go back to what they used to do, whether again, it's seeing friends in a group, going to a party, going on a date, It's just a different feel. And it's going to take a while for us to be comfortable. And as I tell my clients, take baby steps. You don't have to just jump in. I had a client um, who's 72 and she said to me last week, she said, you know, when we were on lockdown, I, you know, I was, I was stressed. I was anxious. I was isolated. I was lonely. She goes, now things are opening up. She goes, and I'm starting to do everything. She goes, like, I feel like I have to do everything. She goes, I'm so busy taking classes and doing groups and doing things at my temple that I'm so overwhelmed. And she goes, and I realized I don't even think I want to do it all. And what happened is she got FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. Because she's been locked down for so long, she felt this sudden urge that she needed to go do everything out of fear. What if this happens again? Or, you know, what if I can't go out? What am I missing? And she's overwhelmed herself so much that she's like, I need a break from that. And she said, it's really hard. She goes, because I feel like I have to be on because it's been so long that I want to be entertaining. I want to be fun. And she's putting all this pressure on herself. So remember, going back out, even though it's great that everything is open and we're getting back to normal and all that safety with our vaccines and sanitizer and all of that great stuff. Take baby steps because you don't want to feel overwhelmed and put too much pressure on you, or you don't want to get too anxious and have social anxiety because you're not used to it. The other thing is making sure that you know being lonely and being alone are two different things. You can be lonely in a large group of people. And I've had clients who've said this to me for many years that they'd be at a party or a dinner with all their friends or family members and still feel alone because they weren't feeling an emotional connection. They felt different. They felt they didn't fit in. And then there's people who, when they're alone, feel amazing being alone. They don't feel lonely. They actually say they feel solitude. They feel peace. So again, there is a difference between being lonely and being you know, alone. So just remembering that even during a time like this, there were times that, you know, I felt the isolation. I have been working from home since day one. And here in the New York, New Jersey area, maybe in the fall, we'll go back to a little bit of in-person. I'll be going back to in-person teaching at the college. But outside of that, nothing else has really gone back. We're now in a hybrid world where people like the Zoom and like to do things from home and virtual. So I have to say, even though I felt that loneliness and isolation, I also still enjoy my alone time. And there are times that I know I need to feel, you know, to reboot, to refuel alone. And it gives me that sense of solitude, that sense of peace and calm. So just remembering there's a difference between loneliness and being alone. Now, a little bit more about this. Most people do struggle with loneliness throughout their lifetime. So 
it's completely normal. It's completely natural to feel loneliness. Every human being, no matter their age, where they live, their gender, it doesn't matter. Everybody will feel loneliness at one time or another. And that's completely normal. And people always think, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to feel this because they think of loneliness and isolation as a sense of pain. But there is some teachable, learnable information we can get out of being lonely in isolation. There is something it's trying to tell us, which I'll get a little bit more into. But if you are feeling lonely, isolated, depressed, remember it's normal, it's natural. As we said, 46 million people feel that because they feel they only have one person or nobody. So don't feel bad about talking about it. You will not be judged. You know, it's not something that you can't share. I know a lot of people feel there's like a stigma towards it and they feel like they'll be judged. They feel like they'll be unliked for it. They'll be different. And, you know, one of my clients said, you know, I'm afraid to tell any of my friends that I feel lonely. And I, when I asked her why, she said, I'm afraid they're going to think like I'm a loser. Like what? You don't have friends. Your family doesn't want to see you. What's going on? And that's not the case. Sometimes we get these kind of internal dialogue, this negative self-talk or self-bullying, as we call it, where we're very harsh, judgmental, critical to ourselves. And I don't want you to do that because the truth is everybody feels lonely at one time or another, actually more than one time or another. We're all going to go through, whether it's a loss of a loved one, whether it's, and it could be loss of a loved one, it doesn't have to be death, it could be a breakup, it could be a divorce. It doesn't matter if we're going through a change, a transition, a shift, we move, we retired, we had empty nests where our kids moved out. We can easily feel the sense of loneliness and isolation. But if you internalize it, you make it worse. And that's the one thing we don't want people to do because when they internalize what they're feeling, it makes them feel worse because it makes them feel like they have no one and they're self-isolating. So please don't internalize. Remember, we need that support system to heal, to grieve, to forgive. We need that. If we internalize it and we push it down, it will eventually rear its ugly head. Whether it'll come out physically, emotionally, or both, or when, it's different for everybody, but it will do it. So, And the more you hold it in, the more alone you actually feel. So please don't do that. Next is kind of try to figure out what's the why behind your loneliness. There are different factors why people feel alone. Now, this year alone, we know that people might have felt that just due to the pandemic and COVID. But, you know, looking at the big picture, we've had a life way before COVID and we're going to have a life post-COVID where just, you know, we get back into the way things were normally. And there are different whys. But when we know why we feel lonely, then we can work through it and take action steps. So there are a few different ways we can feel lonely or a few different reasons. I'll go over some, but yours might be different and that's okay, but just try to figure it out. So it could be new place loneliness. So maybe you downsize, you moved from a big house with a community. Now you're in an apartment, a condo, a townhome. That could be, it just could be a new place. It could be that you moved. Maybe you moved because a job or your kids are in a different state and you moved and you feel that loneliness. We also see that with new moms. So when you have a baby and you went from working to now being a stay-at-home mom, but yet you don't really know anybody else who's a stay-at-home and your whole community and socialization is still at work, we can feel it when we don't have an animal. So if we lose our pets, and pets are family, and it doesn't matter what it is, it could be a cat, I'm a dog person, but whatever it is, um, a bunny, it it doesn't matter what type of animal, but animals give us a lot. They give us unconditional love, which is so important. We need that unconditional support and love. And they're always there to greet us. And when we lose an animal, whether it's because we moved and we couldn't bring the animal with us, especially if we downsized and they're not allowed. I've had clients who had to, unfortunately, you know, put their pet up for adoption because they became very allergic and it was causing too many problems with asthma and sinus problems. It could be that they've passed on 
and they went to the Rainbow Bridge. I hope everybody knows the Rainbow Bridge because I know some of my clients are like, what's the Rainbow Bridge? That's where I'm hoping to go, where all my animals are. But when we lose an animal, not only do we lose the love, but we lose that we feel more lonely because the house can be empty, especially if you live alone. So animals can cause this loneliness and isolation. My clientele as a therapist is with traumatic brain injury and spinal injury. I have a lot of military. And for my clients, for them to actually start getting out and socializing or to get to live alone, I use pet therapy, a dog. And it is one of the only ways I've gotten so many of my clients to move out on their own, to get over their social anxiety, their PTSD, their loneliness and isolation. And it is an amazing, an amazing technique using animals. The only downside is eventually they will pass on and they don't live as long as us. So preparing for that too, when, you know, for us, what we do when an animal gets to a certain age and we retire them from being a therapy dog, but they're still your pet, you bring in a new dog. And even though when you lose one, you still love them and it takes a piece of your heart, it takes away some of the loneliness. So animal, feeling different than everyone. And this can be, again, where people can say they're in groups, whether it's work, school, friends, community, where they're with a group of people, but they just feel no emotional connection. They just feel like they don't connect to the other people. They feel different. So I have a client who recently moved into senior living, and she said, you know, I feel very awkward. She goes, because I moved into a place where... It's very religious and they all go to church on Sunday and they have prayers. And she's like, I think that's wonderful, but I wasn't raised with that. I have no religious background. I don't go to church or temple. I, I don't you know, have any interest in it. I'm not even really aware. I'm not big on the holidays. It's making me feel really different. So sometimes it's just feeling unique or feeling different than the people you're surrounded by. That can make you feel lonely. No sweetheart loneliness. So if you're not dating somebody, if you just went through a breakup, a divorce, a loss, and not having that companionship for a lot of people, that is their companionship is the other person that can feel it unfulfilling friendships, especially friendships. Again, you can have a lot of friends, but if it's not reciprocal and you feel like they're one-sided, unbalanced relationships, you could feel very lonely in those friendships. Or it could just be, again, the lack of friendships, like if you lose driving, you move, all of those things, any transition can cause loneliness. So, you know, know the why, because when you know the why, then we can figure out what action steps to take forward to fix it. There's many different reasons. So, you know, if it's somebody who's lost an animal, but they moved into a place and they can't have one, maybe we'll have them volunteering at a shelter. So this way they're getting it. If it's no sweetheart loneliness, maybe it is time for them to start dating. If it's transition and they, you know, they just retired, then it's maybe forming new hobbies, taking new classes to meet new people, to gain new interests. But knowing the why really helps. The other thing that can be a trigger is when do you feel the loneliness? So what I mean by that is for a lot of us, we can be occupied even just by TV shows, being on social media, Googling, running into people, shopping, doing our normal routines. But there are always certain times of the day that people say they feel their loneliness and that's where it really hits us. So know that. So if it's a nighttime, maybe you feel the worst at night, especially, you know, because maybe you're not with your spouse anymore and you used to spend dinners and watch your favorite shows. This might be the time that you call a friend. This might be the time where you go out to you know the community settings in your area and talk to other people. Maybe this is the time that you will go to the restaurant in your place so you don't feel that loneliness. If it's morning, because a lot of people said they had a morning routine and they always woke up together, whatever it is, or the kids are gone, whatever it is, and maybe in the morning, instead of staying home and feeling it, you'd go outside for a walk or you would join a gym or a studio where you could take a yoga class where you can connect with other people. So when we tend to be bored, when we tend to be alone, that's when a lot of that negative thoughts come up. And again, those are the thoughts like, well, I'm always going to be alone. No one's ever going to want to date me or, you know, nothing goes right for me. 
or I don't have friends like everybody else. Something must be wrong with me. And we start that judgment, that harsh, that critical negative self-talk, which just leads into a vicious cycle of just beating ourselves up, but not taking action to move forward. So know the why and know when you feel the loneliest so we can work on it and move forward. Now a little bit about bouncing back. So as I said in the beginning, loneliness really can be used as a teachable, learnable moment. So when you're feeling lonely, when you're feeling isolated, which again could lead to depression, you want to think about it as like an alarm going off. It's a wake up call saying, hey, you know what? You need to take some steps forward to be more social and to be more connected. Now, remember, some people will isolate themselves. And I just want to bring that up. When people get depressed, they naturally socially withdraw and they isolate themselves. You know, a lot of my clients were saying a lot of their kids got really depressed during COVID or not even just during COVID, during other times in their teen years where they would isolate themselves and not come out of their rooms. And that is something we worry about. So if you're feeling lonely, kind of notice, am I self-isolating? Am I not saying yes to invites? Am I not asking people to spend time together? Am I not enjoying the usual activities that I used to? Because if it's turned into depression, you might want some added guidance with this, whether it's reaching out to a spiritual advisor, a minister, a priest, a rabbi, to the social worker, if you're at a place, or a counselor, a psychologist, a coach, whoever it is, or reach out to a friend or family to really help. So remember, depression has a few different um, ways, signs or symptoms, ways to know. So isolation and loneliness are top factors, but it could also be withdrawing, not feeling the usual interest, fun, happiness that you get when you see people or do those activities that you love. You could be feeling sadness, hopelessness, helplessness, and having that rumination of all those thoughts where you just feel like you can't stop it. It affects your mood, it affects your day, it affects your sleep. So really making sure, did isolation and loneliness, is it situational, is it something that I can deal with, or did it turn into depression, or of course, anxiety as well. But in general, if you don't have the other symptoms, it is a warning sign. It's an alarm going off saying to you, you're isolating too much, it's going to lead to loneliness, you need to make a change and figure out why you're feeling this way. So making sure, so use it as an alarm. Really, it, it's a preventative way before it turns into depression and or anxiety. Because remember, depression and anxiety can work together. You can be depressed and anxious, and we don't want that. And the other thing to remember is after a year and three, four months, almost a year and a half of a pandemic, we're also grieving. And you don't have to necessarily just grieve if you lost someone due to death. And if you did, obviously you're grieving, but we can also feel the grief from just losing our socialization, our security, our normalcy, um, relationships that we've lost. There's a lot in there and grief can also make us withdraw and feel depressed as well. And if you're having any of that or you notice it with other people, please reach out. Also remember this, we've all felt lonely. We have all felt isolated. We've all suffered. And even though no one wants to suffer and doesn't wish suffering on anybody else, suffering is what connects us because we can all understand what it feels like. So I might not understand your why. Maybe I've never been through your why. Maybe I've never been in a divorce. Um, maybe I've never moved yet and I didn't have my family or my circle around me. But we all know what it feels like to have the emotions of sadness, hurt, fear, anxiety, that we all do, we can all relate and empathize to the emotions behind it. So we do all connect. So please don't feel fearful to talk to your friends and family, reach out to anybody that you know is in your community because we all can relate and it's what connects us. And a lot of times when we open up and share, it allows somebody else to open up and share. And that's important just by us being authentic, being true, being vulnerable, and expressing our fear, our loneliness, it can allow other people to say, oh my God, I'm feeling the same way. Or to go, 
oh, I'm so thankful I'm not the only one. I was feeling like something's wrong with me. Hey, maybe we can work through this together. So really don't hold it in, don't internalize. So stopping the self-judgment. So letting go of judging yourself for feeling lonely is one of the first steps. Because again, for many of us, we have what we call the inner bully. And what I mean by that is we all have self-talk. Everybody has self-talk. We all talk to ourselves. Even if you don't want to admit it, we all do. But because we all have what's called a negative bias, we tend to lean towards the negative, notice the negative, get stuck in the negative. And for a lot of us, that's blaming ourselves, calling ourselves names, berating ourselves. And just so you know, it does nothing for us. It makes it worse. And the way we treat ourselves, that self-judgment, it's not the way we would talk or treat anybody else. So when you're going through a hard time and you hear that self-talk going, pay attention to it and ask yourself, would I say what I'm saying to myself to a friend? If I wouldn't say it to a friend or a family member, somebody I care about, why am I saying it to myself? And remember, the more we criticize ourselves, the worse we feel. So stop the judgment. Feel it. Know you're feeling lonely. Figure out the why, the times when you're the loneliest, and then work through it. But don't beat yourself up for it. You want to take action, but you don't want to beat yourself up. There's also some other reasons for loneliness that really, again, weren't around when I was younger, but because of today's technology, right, and all the cell phones, or smartphones, iPads, PCs, all of that, it's really kind of made things harder for a lot of us. It's very challenging to establish and maintain really strong relationships. You know, being friends with people virtually, people that you've never met before, but maybe through a support group online, maybe through social media, there's great and there's nothing wrong with having those friends. And it can help us to feel less lonely. But on the other hand, we don't want to get stuck in that because we do need the in-person. The other thing we've noticed is with there's a generational difference. So with your kids, your grandkids, they actually socialize differently than the rest of us, like 40 and over crowd, middle adult and late adult. And for them, it's very normal to just communicate, just socialize through texting, through emails. And that doesn't give the same feeling. But they won't know that you're feeling lonely unless you tell them. They won't know that this is not working for you because it's what they're used to. And it's taken away a lot from communication. And it's taken away from a lot of them spending even time alone and getting to know themselves. But it is the way it is. And there's a lot of advantages to technology as well as disadvantages. So if your kids and grandkids typically email or text, you can use that. But you might want to say to them, hey, you know, maybe once a week we could do a phone call or a Zoom call. Because at least hearing the voice or seeing them takes away from some of the loneliness and makes you feel connected. Texting an email, it doesn't make you feel that way. It's a great source for, hey, what time do you want to meet? What do you think of these places? What are you bringing to the party? Um, you know, the weather's going to be good. Bring your shorts, the bathing suit, you know, whatever it is. But to have in depth, to have deep conversations, meaningful conversations, we need more than that. So it's telling them, you know, sitting down with your kids and grandkids and saying, hey, you know, it's different for me. I really don't enjoy emails or texting, unless you do. Um, and I don't mind doing that once in a while, but could we maybe talk by phone once a week or have a virtual, whether it's Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, whatever it is, and let them know, plus seeing each other in person, if you can, depending about COVID and also how far away they live. But really talking about that, because that's been one of the biggest things I hear from my adult clients. And again, the 40s, midlife and up, is that they feel disconnected and not just because of COVID with their kids and grandkids because they don't have that connection because they don't get to see them often. One was COVID, two busy schedules, and three, a lot of them live in different states. And a text is nice just saying, hey, I'm thinking of you and letting them know, but it's not the same as catching up and having a full-blown conversation, hearing and seeing each other. So really have that conversation because again, texting and email, doesn't make us feel less lonely. Maybe a little bit makes you feel thought about, 
for a little bit, but it doesn't give that sense of community support and socialization that we need. So if you're combating loneliness, you wanna work through it, you wanna use loneliness to motivate us to reach out to people. So again, here's another way we can use loneliness as a motivational tool, as a gift, as a teacher. I'm feeling lonely. I don't wanna feel like this. I don't wanna feel depressed. How can I strengthen my relationships? Really important, how can I strengthen them? Or extend and create new ones. Now, first things is we all need support, as I talked about. And the key with support is we all need unconditional support. And what I mean by unconditional is those are people in your life who you love and respect and who love and respect you back unconditionally. And that's important. So when we have people in our lives, it could be our own parents, grandparents, it could be friends, it could be family, doesn't matter, who love us with conditions. They love us when everything's going well, when we're having fun, when we're not asking for anything. That's fine, but it's not deep and it's not people we can trust and who we could be vulnerable with. And if we don't have those people where we could be vulnerable, we could be open, authentic, then we're gonna internalize everything, which leads to depression and anxiety. So you wanna make sure to strengthen the relationships that you trust, to really work on those. Now, this is the thing with support and trust and unconditional. When somebody's unconditional, it doesn't mean they won't tell you the truth. It actually means the opposite. They will be very honest with you. They'll tell you if something you're doing is harmful, unhealthy, but the key here is they will not judge you for it. They will not reject you or abandon you. And that's the really important part. Because if we feel that people are going to judge us, reject us, abandon us, that's when we won't open up and be vulnerable. We'll internalize, we'll withdraw. So that's something you really want to think about. So reach out to your support system. Make sure that you stay in touch with them and not just for them, but for you as well, making sure they're okay and talking for yourselves. So strengthen those relationships, reach out, be connected, really important. Do more things with people, engage as much as you can in social interaction, face-to-face -face, if you can. So these can be activities that just include other people. And there's many simple ways we can do this. You can attend any type of religious or spiritual service, group activities of any type, even dining, going into dining, engaging in any sports, yoga classes, anything. And you want to just find different ways to be around people. And depending what's in your community that you enjoy, do it, whether it's a walking group, whether it's eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner with other people, whether it is taking a class in arts and craft, playing cards, marjan, whatever it is, there's concerts going on, speakers, go be part of it. We need that face-to-face. -face. And a lot of the activities we're doing are outdoors now, one, because the weather's good, finally, and also because of COVID. So doing it outside is always safe and also being in nature. So that helps. The other part is, you know what? We even feel less lonely when we're around people that we're not close to be complete strangers. It could be acquaintances. It could be the people we see every day who serve us at a restaurant if we go, who at the supermarket, if you live at any senior living, any of the staff, those people help us feel connected. And if you do live at a senior community, the staff becomes family, which is really important for us to feel that way, to have those people because they're part of our support system. So reach out to these people, whether it's the, you know, the cashier at the restaurant or the supermarket, ask how they are, ask what they've been up to. Have these conversations. This means a lot to us. So just so you know, every time we do random act of kindness, we could be as simple now that we don't have masks, right? Now that we can say hi, smile, and everybody can see it, right? It's like a whole new world. Every time we smile at somebody, it gives us a boost of happiness because kindness is a positive emotion. And every time I do that and I do a random act of kindness for somebody, maybe I just smile and ask how they are. 
maybe I give a compliment, maybe I hold the door open and, you know, tell them how beautiful it is outside, whatever it is, I get a boost of happiness that lasts 24 to 72 hours. The person I did the act for gets the same boost of happiness and the bonuses raises our self-esteem. So just by talking to people who are acquaintances, strangers, people you see around your community, even if you just stop and talk for two minutes, pet their dog, ask them about the weather, whatever it is, that helps us feel less lonely. So it doesn't always have to be that you have to talk to your friends and family constantly. If there's people around you that you can reach out to and talk and have those interactions, that helps us to feel less lonely as well. So you want to do that. Hop online in a meaningful way. So if you're going to spend time on social media, on the computer, you don't want to just scroll out of boredom, whether it's Facebook or just Googling, doing games. We get really bored and it's very, it can be overstimulating as well. So instead, do something that actively involves you. Join a support group. There's so many virtual support groups. And again, I'd rather you be in support groups in person, but what if you can't, whether it's COVID, driving, times, distance, support groups, you can see each other, really important. Play a game where you're interacting with other people online. So not necessarily like solitaire on the computer where it's just you, but play against other people. Have a virtual coffee date. Have a virtual happy hour with your friends, especially people who don't live near you. Connect with people. If you're going to use online or you're not able to go out yet or for different reasons, still virtually connect with people. Again, in person's always better, but the second best would be virtual. Spend time in nature. When we're in nature, it helps us naturally to feel less alone. So just taking a walk in nature whether you know people or it might be walking at a park and you don't know anybody, but you see a lot of people around and people with their dogs just smiling at each other as you walk by. Being in nature, it helps us to feel less alone. Animals do the same thing, of course, as we talked about. So one of the things is if you want to volunteer, whether it's at an animal shelter or a rescue place, a lot of my clients do that and you're looking to volunteer, there's a great website online called volunteermatch.org. You go on this website and you just put in your zip code and a whole bunch of different volunteer positions come up. You could even customize it to say what you're interested in, animals, kids, whatever it is, and it'll come up. Some volunteer is online. So if you're still not feeling comfortable, there's other reasons that you can't do it in person, there are volunteer positions online or from home, or you can find a place that's near you. And again, it could be very few. I have a client to 74 and she volunteers just one day a week for three hours at an animal shelter. And that's all that she needs, but it gives her a socialization. It gives her unconditional love and she loves animals. So that's another way, but being outdoors. So if you, let's say you love outdoors and you wanna do something with others, maybe an outdoor yoga group, maybe a walking group. I have a client who wanted to find a biking group and he said none of his friends will bike. He's 78 and he goes biking every Saturday. You can go on meetup.com. And meetup.com is not a dating site whatsoever. It's a socialization site. And what again you do is you go on meetup.com, you put in your zip code and it'll tell you all the events that are going on both virtually and in person around you in your area. Now, if it's virtual, it doesn't even need to be in your area, but if you wanna be in person, it'll give you that. If you don't see what you're looking for, like I had a client say to me a few months ago, she wanted to be part of a book club. And she said, you know, I love my friends, but none of them are really into that. She went on meetup.com. She couldn't find a local in-person meetup um, for doing you know, a book club. You can start your own. That's the amazing thing. You can start your own group if you don't see. And this is another way to just get yourself interested in new, exciting opportunities. It's a way to new, meet new people, to socialize and do hobbies that you love. So you have volunteermatch.com, I'm Dr. Rourke, I'm sorry, and meetup.com. And lastly, spend your time and money on experiences, not things. So when we hold on to experiences, every time we create a new experience, whether it's a party, an event, 
a luncheon, a wedding, it doesn't matter what it is. We hold on to those memories and experiences and they last a lifetime. And when we're having a bad day, we just take a few minutes, either look at pictures or close our eyes and visualize that event. It'll bring the same happiness back up. So spend your time creating memories and experiences. When you're in them, you enjoy them and you can always go back to them and relive them and feel the same happiness. So spend the money instead on taking a class, learning a new language, taking a cooking class, going on a trip, whatever it is. And my client too, um, 72 who lives alone, she does trips before COVID, but she plans on doing one this fall. She goes in groups, she's single and alone, and she will go and meet in their small groups and they'll travel to different areas. She goes through a travel agent and she'll take these trips and she meets a whole bunch of new people. And it ends up that she became friends with a lot of these people. And now they do their own groups of going away. And COVID, you know, stopped that for a little while, but she's back up to it. So memories, experiences. So I want to go to um, the end just to give you my email because I know we're running out of time and I want to open up for questions. But if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, you're more than welcome to it. You can email me again, I'm Diane at DL Counseling 2014 at Gmail. If you have any questions, thoughts, comments you wanna ask privately or you think about later, please again, feel free to email at any time. I will always respond and I can answer any questions. Diane, awesome information, fantastic tips. And uh, here's a question for you. Uh, and for anybody out there who is watching and wants to uh, ask Diane a question, this is the time to do it. Scroll down to the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A, and uh, I'm happy to read your question. You can, of course, remain anonymous. So I, I love this saying, loneliness acts as fertilizer for other diseases. And it has been proven that uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, weakened immune system, depression, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's. I mean, I can, there's a list. It's a laundry list. Oh yeah, it's long. Of things, yeah, that, that it affect our health what, that are directly tied to, to this, to loneliness. So it, and what other ways does this affect our health, Diane, that you have seen with clients and how can we help sort of connect those dot, dots to get to the root of the problem? So Carolyn, I put my email address up there. I was just answering a question as we spoke um, and I'll repeat it at the end as well. But loneliness and isolation, absolutely. What it does is the same thing as stress, anxiety. It lowers your immune system, which also can cause a lot of issues of high blood pressure, heart problems, a lot of stomach problems, ulcers, acid reflux, you know, all of that can happen. So we want to be careful of that. And not just because of COVID with lowering our immune system, but then we catch every cold and flu that comes our way. So that's why I want people to be really mindful of, am I just lonely and isolated because of the situation? And it doesn't have to be COVID. It could be that you just moved and you just haven't had a chance to be that, you know, you're transitioning and you know, you'll be in a new place in a few months where you can socialize. You're just not there yet or your new stay-at-home mom, you know, whatever it is, or is this leading to something more? Is it that I'm isolated and lonely because I am depressed and that's something, or I'm heartbroken or I'm grieving? Those are when you want to reach out. And my suggestion is, you know, I don't always suggest counseling. It's not always the answer for everyone. So I don't want anybody to feel that way. And even though I'm a therapist, I still realize that for everybody, it's not the same. Like even for bereavement groups, I've had many clients that I wouldn't suggest a bereavement group until at least a year after their situation that they're grieving. They're just not ready for it. But if you're feeling depression or anxiety, you do want to reach out at least to your family doctor or somebody on staff, a social worker to talk to them to really analyze, do I need extra guidance? Do I need counseling of any type? Or there are a lot of people, especially during COVID, who would go on a very low dose of like a Lexapro, which is for anxiety or depression. And again, just to put this out there, it doesn't solve your problems going on a pill. But as my clients say, it'll take the edge off that they can manage better, think through less rumination to do the work they need to do to get to that healthy place. So, or both. So those options are always available. Or for some people, it might just be talking to you know, the social worker, if you're out of senior living, it might be talking to a friend and family, a spiritual advisor, but please, please don't internalize. 
and use those signs and symptoms as teachable, learnable moments. What do I need to do here? Do I just need to make some changes personally? Do I need to reach out? I've got one from Carolyn. And uh, just so that everybody can, can hear the question, uh, she says, my mom has sundowners syndrome. She lives alone and I'm trying to get her to move to assisted living, but she likes living alone and she likes being alone. So what are some suggestions there? Um, sometimes you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. You know, this is a very hard thing because the truth is we can't control anybody else but ourselves. And we can control how we react and respond, but that's about it. Um, and I had the same situation personally, Carolyn. My mother, um, she passed away now, but this was about a few years ago. She ended up having pneumonia so bad that she was in a coma for days. And she, I'm, I'm from Long Island, New York. I don't know if anybody else is from that area, but I now live in New Jersey. And when that happened, my mom refused to move, but my sister and I are in New Jersey now. And we kind of gave her an ultimatum. And I hate saying that. And we just said, listen, because of the situation, if something happens to you, we can't get to you for just two hours, just for a distance. But if you know the New York City tri-state area, two hours turns into four with traffic, you will be alone. And you know, I'm not giving you an ultimatum. If you choose to stay here, we totally understand and respect. My mom was 78 or 79 at the time. I said, but you'll have to know that the consequences are if something does happen, your family is not local enough to be here in 15, 20 minutes. And just laying out the truth of the situation, actually, right, and your mom lives far, actually made the difference. And I have to tell you, my mom wouldn't move for years. It turned into, it had to be a situation that motivated her to move, but being honest, because my at first, the rest of my family doesn't live close. They were like, oh, do what you want. And she would have stayed. But my sister and I just saying, we can't be there. And you saw what happened this time. It took us like six hours to get there. By the time we got the call, picked each other up and just here trying to get over the GW and cross Bronx, it was rush hour. It took us over five hours to get there. And she was alone in a hospital. And by the time we got there, she was in a coma. And that is not something we wanted to happen again. And being that honest, tactfully was the wake up call. And it might have to get to that place. If they don't move, then you wanna take every safety precaution get one of those life alerts, you know, really have neighbors, people who aren't called just in case. But if you do force her instead of encourage, encourage is different than forcing. You do have to know that even if it is the best thing and you're doing it for the right reasons, they could become resentful and they could be angry and it could be a long road. So what you can do is when she visits, if she can, or if you go to visit her, you can go to some places and take a tour, like go into an arbor, take a tour and let them make the decision themselves. You know, just take them around and say, we're not pushing you to do anything. I just want you to see your options. Do a virtual tour when you're with her. You know, those are some of the options. You can have her doctor, if you go to a doctor visit with her, who can recommend the same. Sometimes that helps if there's other family members who can get involved, that might help. But again, unfortunately we can't force people I mean, you could, but it would be a very tough decision to do. And I don't recommend it because then we see a lot of anger. So if you can encourage, it's always best. And that is a really delicate situation and a tough balance act. I mean, uh, you live in Maryland, she's in Maine. That is, that is right. tough. But I, I do hope, uh, Carolyn, that, that that sort of helped you out a little bit. Those were some great examples and some great tips um, from Diane. And we hope that, that maybe you can use those in your next conversation with your mother. Now we do have an, another question here from Karen and, and to share her situation. Mom is almost 97, lives four hours away from me in her own apartment at a senior living, it looks like a community. Uh, I check in by phone three times a day. She's been very tearful in these conversations, uh, which is not like her. She's a World War II vet. Thank your mom for her service. Absolutely. About plenty caring of uh, soldiers in the Philippines and Tokyo. She said, what would you suggest in this situation? She has refused to move to New Jersey over the years, which is where I assume you live, Karen. Uh, she told me that she's cried more this year than at any other time. And it's, it's really, really awful way to live your final, final years. And I agree with that. Uh, it says the community she lives in is facing a multitude of issues, financial caregivers with burnout, et cetera. 
She doesn't fault them, uh, Diane, but she says, I've heard of other places that went out of their way to keep their residents engaged yeah. during COVID. What can you suggest? How can you help Karen? So even if she won't move to New Jersey, and um, I'm not sure where you are, Karen, but I'm in New Jersey. So um, there's a lot of great places here, but even if she's not willing to, is she willing to move to another assisted living place in her area that's better suited for her? Um, yes, you know, I just to tell you, caregiver burnout's a real thing in every assisted living, senior living, nursing homes, hospitals. I mean, it's a hard job. Uh, it's a really hard job. So I can understand the burnout, not an excuse though. They still needed to step up to the plate and keep everybody in the assisted living, not just safe and comfortable, but challenged and not bored. And that is their job to do that. And if they didn't, I would look into other places that are local in her area. If she just needs somebody to talk and vent to, almost every therapist at this point is doing virtual. So I don't know if she's willing to see somebody from the comfort of her own home virtually. Um, she does not have to leave, it's safe. Um, and that be, might be another way for her to get some extra advice and guidance um, and her insurance should cover it. There are people who, you know, take, I know a lot of therapists don't take insurance anymore, but you can find somebody that, and I would also reach out to the social worker at the assisted living center and have a talk with them literally have a talk. And one of the other things is a lot of my clients are in group homes and when they're not satisfied with the workers, and again, they're caregivers and they're burnt out and we understand that they've gotten personal aides and companions who have come to the place and would stay for a few hours. Um, we did that with my mom at the end. She had the beginnings of dementia. Um, she was in assisted living, but she didn't wanna to go to a nursing home and she needed a little more. And we hired somebody who we just said was a friend. She never even knew that she was a companion and she would eat lunch with her, make sure she ate lunch. She'd wash her hair sometimes. She didn't have to, but she just cared. And she played games with her and watched TV with her and took her outside. It made a huge difference. So they don't always have to be home health aides or CNAs. You can have a companion. They're not the ones who take care of the medication or blood pressure or anything, but just for companionship. And a lot of times you can hire um Believe it or not, some of the local colleges, I'm not sure where you are, but like a lot of my students would do it, psych majors at Montclair or Rutgers. If any of that's near you, reach out to me and I can see if any of my students are available. Um, and again, is there a situation that there is a place local to her that you can look into if she doesn't want to move to New Jersey? So just a few options. And even if the companionship's done virtually a little bit, even if you can't find somebody to come in, but just somebody she can talk to. And, and, and that's the biggest factor for loneliness. That's one of the biggest things. I've seen my clients when they are unchallenged, um, whether they're seniors or just the brain injury, because a lot of my brain injury clients have Alzheimer's dementia due to the brain injury. When they don't have the right care and the right companionship, it really, and they're unchallenged and they get bored, you definitely see them cognitively decline. So really important to get that help. And Karen, if I can help you, if you can't get it to New Jersey or you want anybody help with that, and if you can't get her here, or I don't know where you're located, but North Jersey, some of the greatest arbors, and I'm not saying that because this is arbor, they are that great. Um, Roseland and Morris Plains come right up there. I mean, I would move in tomorrow if they would let me. <laughs> They're just that amazing, beautiful, and caring staff. But even if it's not that, just let us know how we can help. Yeah, well, we hope that that helps you a little bit um, with your question. And, and again, thank your mom for her service. And I hope that uh, you're able to, to find a solution that works for everyone. Uh, one final question, and, and I think we go back to that checklist, Diane, of, of what can I look out for for my loved one? And also, what, what can I look at internally at myself? And so the final question here, in what ways does losing that sense of connection uh, and community change a person's perception of the world? Oh, I mean, when you lose all of that, it can make you really not want to be here. I mean, just being totally honest makes people feel that they're alone, that there's no kind people left in the world. It can make them angry and frustrated. It's very individual for everybody because it depends also what you've been through in the past and the reason behind it. 
you know, if it's due to COVID, some people are more understanding. If it's due to uh, personal situations, it can cause a lot of resentment. So it's, it's one thing we don't want people to have to deal with. You know, we can't live a perfect life, but we can definitely have socialization and support. And that's something that we all need. And it, you know, without it, we're not happy. And we don't have, I remember this, when we are emotionally, mentally not in a good place, we're not in a good place physically because it's that mind-body connection. So we need to take care of everything holistically. Yeah, excellent. Well, we have gone to the hour, top of the hour here, and uh, a lot of great questions today, a lot of great answers. Diane, great information as always. We thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us. Thank you so much for having me. And again, um, if you want my email, because I said I would say before, Carolyn, I know you asked, it's just dlcounseling2014 at Gmail. And if you have any questions, thoughts, or comments, I will absolutely, or you could always reach out to Melissa and they will pass it to me. If anybody wants a copy of the PowerPoint, feel free to, and I can mail it, email it to Melissa as well. So yeah. thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thank you. And that, that does bring us to our, our next uh, quick topic of discussion. This webinar will be available to everyone starting tomorrow. You will get an email, all of you who are SVP to watch today uh, with this link and you can share it with friends, family members, uh, whomever you want. Uh, and then it will of course be available on our website, www.seniorlivinglive dot com. There you can check out this webinar. You can preview what's coming up over the next couple of months and check out our past video content all about senior living. Well, we thank you all for taking the time to spend it with us here this afternoon. Thank you for watching. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, everybody.